Hello, my name is Gregory Sizemore. I'm a senior software engineer at Capital One, and I'm here to talk today about practical closure profiling in production. Um, the specific project I work on at Capital One is an app called Level Money. It's a personal finance app. It helps you track your budget and your spending. And um, it has multiple front ends, iOS, Android, web, serviced by a fairly large closure API. The code base has been around for a few years now. Um, and so the thing I want to talk about, so your app is slow. Um, our app was slow um, because we had uh, recently re-architected the way our clients interacted with our API. Specifically, there were multiple API calls that were always being made in a particular sequence. So we refactored it so that there would be one API call that would return all of that data at once so you didn't have to make multiple calls. The idea is to reduce network overhead, which can be a big deal over cell cellular networks, and better utilize our cache. Um, when we first made this transition, the new endpoint was slow, too slow to be acceptable. It took 30 seconds to three minutes, depending on um, what was happening on cache misses. We were taking pretty good advantage of our cache, which is why it wasn't just terrible. Um, so uh, I was did a project to improve this and make this endpoint you know, acceptably fast, even on cache misses. Um, and I would like, I'm going to walk through an example of one of the pieces of doing that and give you an idea of how um, the approach I took, profiling as well as some tools I used and how they work, and some gotchas with Clojure um, that made it a little more challenging than with in some other languages I've worked in. So this is the basic code that we're profiling. We identified this as one piece of being slow. So there were a lot of um, sort of hot spots. We did some very basic profiling because we knew that the API endpoint was slow, and we identified this as one of the sub-functions. But we didn't know what part of this was, um, for sure, was slow. Um, it looked like maybe it was something to do with this uh, um, bit on the right. So we put in a windowing to like reduce the input. This was just a very, very first go, not based on much data. Which brings me to my sort of first philosophical point about profiling. Measure twice, code once. Um, when you're writing new code, speed often isn't your first concern. Other things, in my opinion, quite correctly come first, like how long the development time, how long it takes to write the code, as well as the readability. And writing optimized code is a trade-off. It often takes longer to write, um, and it's often harder to understand. Maybe it uses some obscure data structures, maybe it has to be structured in a particular way um, to make it faster. So you don't always want to write optimized code the first go, um, especially because there's one, uh, often one, one or a few pieces of code that dominate the time complexity. Others that may not be theoretically optimally performant, but maybe they only get called with small input sizes. So is it really worth it to spend the development time and the potential for reducing readability in your code base to, to change those? Probably not. So we want to, when profiling all, or when optimizing code, always make sure that we are going on numbers that we have measured and are sure that the code we're changing is actually the, the, what's responsible for it being slow. One of the, the tool I used to do this in this project was YourKit. Um, I, it's great at this sort of investigative profiling. Um, it has a ton of features. It can do sampling, tracing of CPUs. It has great amount of stuff it sort of tries to figure out for you, um, which closures can throw some wrenches into that. And it has decent support for memory profiling, though not great because it runs in the JVM. So if you run the JVM out of memory, you can't get a memory dump. Really helpful. But for CPU profiling, it's great. Another alternative is JVisual VM. It's pretty similar to your kit, the same basic idea. Um, it's free. It comes with, with um, the JDK. Um, it's also good at investigative profiling, but it has fewer features. It, um, you can sort of see comparison between the two that, yeah, 
Um, but it can work. If, if free is important, it's a, it's a choice. Um, so profiling the function uh, functions I was had up on the slide earlier. This is opening your kit. Um, I have, have already run in a REPL that function, called it with uh, arguments that I knew were slow. And now I've opened, I've finished that and opened up your kit. And we can, you can see that it's giving you the call tree of how methods were called. And I don't recognize anything from my project here yet. There's this A fun stuff that looks fun. Um, Digging down some more, I'm still not recognizing anything from my project. There's a lot of stuff from inREPL, from Closure Core. You can filter some of this stuff out in your kit, but it can be a little challenging to figure out what exactly to filter out, especially with Closure Core, because sometimes there are functions that you want to know if they're involved in perf issues. Sometimes you maybe don't care. Sometimes they're implementation details. Um, anyway, let's see if we can get something better. Hotspots, that seems like something I want to find. If we go and look, lazy seek. It's a big culprit. But really, that's just because you use lazy seeks everywhere in Clojure. And um, it's not really, there's really nothing here that's instructive either. So maybe go here. We can search in the method list for the, the function we were profiling. So we find it, you can see, you can backtrace and even see all of the stuff that Clojure and the compiler did to uh, up the call stack. Um, right there, there's our fun a fun. Um, and then the merge callies, which is all of the calls that that function made, which is what we're looking for so we can maybe drill down and see the hotspot. There's the reduce that was the first uh, part of that function that looks good. Um, digging down some more, we have some more uh, stuff we don't recognize. OK, detect, text, and transfer. That was, that was one of the functions that we were looking at profiling. And you can see that seek is one of the top things under that. Digging down some more, more lazy seek. It'd be a little hard to figure out what's, what's going on. And you can see that the call count um, is a lot higher. It's pretty, I think we found some in squared uh, stuff going on here. Digging down, we see that the transfer question mark function that was um, also there. See it show up here, but a lot of the time it seems like it's taken up by things like math. More, I think we've, we've found the problem is um, filtering this trans something by this transfer function. So um, this brings me to another point about profiling and optimizing in general, which is in the title of the talk, why you should profile on production data. That's sort of where the in production comes from, because uh, you want to replicate something like what you're actually seeing in production because for a couple of reasons. One, customers often find unexpected ways to use software. That's like very much something in software testing as well. Um, in this case, especially a culprit is input you expected to be small was large. So one of the th things that came up in this project with this was people who had way more transactions than we expected for whatever reason. Maybe many bank accounts, maybe they accidentally hooked up a business, who knows. Um, but the other component of this is that sometimes realistic data has structure you can exploit. Where if you think about you know, what is the theoretical performance of this, you may not see ways to make it faster, but when you know, oh well, this data is always going to have this structure, almost always going to have this structure, you can often exploit that. It, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Violating the second one often results in edge cases for the first one. Um, so here's the, the code we're optimizing again. And you can see, so this, this code is detecting when two transactions are transfer. So the, the, there are two halves. The idea is you have, say, your credit card connected to our app as well as your bank account. 
and you pay your credit card bill. So there's a debit half on your checking account going out and a credit half on your credit card statement going in and we want to detect when this happens. So what are some of the, what is some of the structure of this data? Well, most people have way fewer credits than they do, or yeah, way fewer credits than they do debits. You know, you get paid once, how many times do you swipe your debit card? Probably a lot, buy groceries, buy gas, um, all kinds of other things. And you know, I wish I had as many credits as debits, but I don't think many of us are there. So um, <clears throat> that's one massive thing we can exploit, right? We, because a transfer needs to have one of each half, one half is way smaller, probably like only two or three. 95% of the time. That, and you can see that that's even um, expressed in this transfer function. It's checking, the first thing it's doing is checking and make sure that you haven't passed in two debits. Because the approach that had been taken was very basic, just like look at all the transactions, look at all the ones you've looked about at, see if you can find something that meets these criteria before. Pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing is that they have to be similar amounts. So now that we've identified this, we can figure out a way to exploit this information to make it faster. And really the only thing that was changed, I didn't even touch the detect, text, and transfer transfer functions because they're still doing their thing, returning the correct result. But we can keep the data structured in a way that lets us easily access those properties so we separate the debits and the credits before we do anything else, and we keep them sorted by, how much, by their amount so that we can easily uh, use this subseq function to find out if they're um, similar amounts. We have, uh, for historical reasons, have, look at sort of a window around um, the amounts, but yeah, um, a lot of this Another sort of principle I like to do when I'm uh, performance profiling is to try to keep the functionality exactly the same and not like m mess with much that isn't about performance. Um, so now the sort of next thing we want to do is make sure that our change actually improved performance because if it didn't, we just wasted a lot of time and need to find out what happens. So now uh, digging down to the same place we see that the tech, text, and transfer has uh, find best match is above the transfer key mark function. There's no 300,000 calls to a lazy seek. This looks better. Um, so yeah, a couple of, now I wanna talk about a couple of gotchas that we can see on the screen. Um, they aren't huge problems in this example, but we can sort of see what it might look like if they were. So reflection is fairly slow. Enclosure uses it a decent bit. It's fine. It usually doesn't matter. It's if you're only doing it once, you know. Um, and you can see this here where in the um, transfer function, one of the things it's doing is there's something invoking reflector here. And compared to something like numbers minus, it's six milliseconds versus less than one. So here it's not a big problem because it's only getting called six times, but if you were having to call it thousands and thousands of times, you, it could be something you looked into. And in another part of this project, I ended up um, having to do one of the things that's a um, solution to this problem, which is to type hint, and it actually got good performance um, results just from letting the compiler know that, hey, you can, you can definitely expect a string here. Oh. But the bigger thing is probably don't worry about, like anything else, don't worry about it until you've measured a problem. Oh. But, and also when you're doing it, it's a hint that the compiler is free to ignore. So sometimes um, it can be tricky to get it in all the right places that you need, and measuring is really important so you don't wind up with 
random type hints scattered throughout your code, which I've seen in Clojure code before. Um, so a second sort of gotcha is um, we saw it a little bit before. It has to do with lazy data structures because you might produce a structure that gets consumed la later. It doesn't always, it means that the uh, time doesn't always show up in the call tree where you expect doesn't always show up where a function or something was created, it can often show up where it was consumed. And it can, it can be mildly confusing to really frustrating. Um, particular causes of confusion is if there's a fairly small like uh, number of elements with a really expensive function, or if a sequence is consumed in multiple places. It can be a little confusing. And you can see it here show up where this uh, make bound function and uh, compare Texans by amount, that is actually from the sorted set container that we created back in the calling function, but it's only getting consumed here. But there's no sort of traces of the calling function left other than this function 5098, which was auto-generated by the compiler, probably because there was an um, anonymous function being made there that's actually doing this work. So um, it can be kind of hard to trace down, also for reasons of the compiler generating stuff like that. So um, here it's not a problem. It's just being consumed. But it could be a problem if this was really expensive to create, because it's not being uh, necessarily clearly consumed in detect, checks, and transfer either. Um, solutions, one is to just sort of be aware of it. If you're profiling, know that, like, that sometimes things might not show up where you expect. And the other thing you can do if you have a, you have to have a pretty good idea of where the problem is, but you can force something to be strictly evaluated. So at least it doesn't, it's sort of, a, before it leaves one function, so at least it sort of doesn't escape. Um, but it's, it can be really tricky to know where to, where to do that so that you don't just wind up with forcing strict evaluation everywhere. Um, but it can really help you get better numbers, especially if you have a sequence that's being consumed in multiple places. Um, so that's the one example with sort of investigating with your kit. Another thing that I like to do that I came up with um, in this project, another point, I wish I'd done it from the beginning, but I only came up with this about halfway in, which is to clearly document performance. Um, because optimized code, remember, it can be harder to understand. So the idea is to document with numbers um, what the performance impact of each commit is. Um, and the other thing you ideally want from it is to include the data you use so it's reproducible. So then. Six months later, when someone else thinks that there's no reason for the code to be slightly confusing and refactors it and makes it slow again, you sort of know what to expect and how to test um, how to test that. Um, this is what I ended up doing. I used Criterium, which is a great closure library that um, is good for getting a realistic picture of actual execution times in production. It like warms up the JIT. It does a lot of stuff to make sure that your um, it's very similar to what you see on a like a web server that's been running for a while or something like that. Um, and so what I did is every change I made in this, I ran criterium before and then ran criterium after to make sure that I was actually improving. So you see I get um, about a six five or six second improvement and then a you know, about a second improvement in these commits on the same data. Um, and then another just sort of funny example is a time when I ignored my own advice of measure once, measure twice, code once, and got really excited about optimizing this algorithm because it had, like, could use kind of a cool data structure and do something like, you know, it was, it was really interesting to work on. And then I finished it, and it, it turns out that I had only made about a 60 millisecond difference, which barely made any difference at all. Theoretically, it's, this was way more performant, 
but in terms of what, what was actually the problem, something else. Um, and then the other, another tool that we used after this project was New Relic to sort of keep an eye on performance. We had uh, performance monitoring with uh, graphite and some um, custom metrics that was really unwieldy. So New Relic is also is a sort of inter, I guess enterprisey tool um, that will hook into your application. It runs an agent and it will report on execution times of what what in its language is called transactions. One nice thing about it is it will automatically pick up certain things, like if you're running a, a web server with Jetty or something, it will uh, measure all of your API requests. So you get a lot for free. Uh, it's great for getting sort of a high level insight. When things are slow, we would have known a lot faster with the project at the beginning if we'd been using it at the time. Uh, it's definitely not for investigative profiling. It, you can capture snapshots and, and whatnot, but like web UI is kind of iffy on, on using it. Oh. And there you can see the transactions. This is just from the New Relic website sort of example data, but it's got like how long each thing is taking, what's the worst, pretty graphs. Um, we've used it since to identify several performance problems and fix them. It's definitely given us earlier warning on, on when we have those sorts of problems. And then another thing we use specifically for closure to work well with New Relic is CLJ New Relic. It's um, a library that basically just this macro, which is kind of interesting, that lets you manually define a function to be a transaction. And the New Relic library expects you to have a Java annotation on a function you want to do this with. And you can make Java annotations in Clojure, but it's a little cumbersome. So this handy macro does it for you. Um, and then uh, sort of one last thing that I, I sort of wish I'd been able to bring this to the talk, but uh, this is a really great visualization tool for um, performance data called Flame Graphs by Brendan Gregg. Um, it sort of visualizes the call stack over time. So the, the y-axis is uh, each level of the call stack and the x-axis is time. So you get a, a good, very quick visual picture of where the problem is. This is, I believe, performance data from the MySQL database. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a parser for your kit and I didn't have time to write one. So the flame graphs, the other parts, of my talk, but yeah. Um, so that is practical closure profiling in production. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>